Virginia Public Broadcasting family. We send you and yours wishes of good health as our state and national officials work to contain the spread of COVID-19. We know you depend on the facts and trustworthy information about the virus you receive from WVPB. We will continue to bring you reliable news and information throughout this pandemic and once we make it through it. Thank you for tuning in to and supporting your West Virginia Public Broadcasting Station. West Virginia Public Broadcasting, made possible by you since 1969. It is a place few Americans know and fewer still understand. A place of terrible beauty that many think of as strange and peculiar. Yet its story is distinctly American. For 50 years, West Virginia Public Broadcasting has been dedicated to the people of the Mountain State. You're watching West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for West Virginia Public Broadcasting comes from contributions from generous viewers like you. Thank you. And from... Here for their future. 529 College Savings Plans. As coronavirus has affected all of your lives out there, it's affected the format and the setting for this debate. We're inside the studios instead of in front of a live audience to follow those precautions. We're gonna get right to it and introduce you to the three candidates vying for the Democratic nomination to run for governor in West Virginia. They are Kanawha County Commissioner Ben Salango, we also have state senator representing Boone County, Ron Stallings, and we have Mr. Stephen Smith, a child advocate here in the Mountain State. Gentlemen, again, thank you for being with us and participating. We're going to begin with the opening statements. We've drawn the order with cards earlier, and Mr. Salango won the opening honors. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. My name is Ben Salango, and I'm running for governor because West Virginia needs new leadership. But before I start, I want to thank all those on the first responders, those on the front lines battling this uh, coronavirus pandemic. We appreciate all that you're doing. And, and let me assure everyone, we're going to get through this. But after this pandemic subsides, we need a leader who can step up and rebuild our economy. We need a leader who can step up and rebuild our workforce. We need a governor who actually wants this job rather than the title. We need somebody who's going to put public service ahead of self-service. As a lawyer for over 21 years, I've stood beside working families. I've stood up for the little guy. I've fought for those who've been ignored, those who've been forgotten. And as a Kanawha County Commissioner, I've created jobs and diversified the economy, including areas that have been hit the hardest by the decline of coal. And over the last 10 to 14 days, I've been in the Emergency Operations Center fighting alongside our first responders, making sure that they have what they need to keep our communities safe. I've proven that I can get things done, and that's why I'm proud that I have the endorsements of the AFL-CIO, the firefighters, the Sheriff's Association. And tonight I can announce that I received the endorsement of the West Virginia School Service personnel. They've endorsed me and they trust me because They've seen what I can do, both as a small business owner and as Kanawha County Commissioner. Look, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I grew up in Glen Morgan on Sullivan Road in Raleigh County. I watched my parents start a little newspaper called the Old Mountain Trader in the living room of our two-bedroom trailer and work night and day to make it a success. That's where I got my work ethic. I'm not afraid of a hard day's work. I'll roll up my sleeves and get things done. I'm Ben Salango, and I'm like you. I'm sick and tired of the empty talk of the career politicians. It's time to get things done. 
And now, Mr. Stallings. Thank you, Martin. It's good to have you back in the state of West Virginia. And thanks to WVVA for hosting this debate. I'm Ron Stallings. I've spent 34 years as an internal medicine doctor in my hometown of Madison, and I've been in the state Senate for 14 years. I'm running for governor because West Virginia families are struggling and hurting, and I love West Virginia and its people. I was raised by a single mother. She died when I was 17 after a five-year struggle with terminal cancer. She was seven, I was 17 and she was 48. My community wrapped its arms around me and through working in the coal mines and at the local funeral home and painting houses, I was able to go to WVU undergraduate, Marshall Med School, and I did my internal medicine residency at Wake Forest University. That, uh, because my community helped me, I came back to care for the community that cared for me. We've had some real challenges and disasters in West Virginia, but we've never seen anything like this coronavirus. It is unprecedented. I applaud the efforts of everyone working on the front lines, healthcare providers, the teachers are trying to feed our kids. You know, we were not prepared. We didn't have enough masks. We didn't have enough personal protective equipment. We cut our budget for public health and the feds cut the budget for CDC. For anyone watching, assume everyone has the virus. That means that you'll distance yourself, you'll wash your hands. When I look at the pressing issues of the state of West Virginia with hospitals closing, the opioid or substance use crisis that we have that are tearing our families and communities apart, prescription drug costs, and now the coronavirus, I feel that I'm uniquely qualified to be the next governor of the great state of West Virginia. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Stallings. And now to Mr. Smith. Thank you so much. All across West Virginia tonight, our people are sick to their stomachs. We're worried for our friends and neighbors who might catch the virus or lose a job. We're worried for our kids and the world we're leaving them. We're worried for our neighbors who are going without. But the people of West Virginia aren't just worrying, we are leading. Every day, tip jars and face masks, organizing food distribution, the people of this state are fighting for each other, but our governor is not fighting for us. This governor has blood on his hands, and it's a story as old as West Virginia. We do all the work while the good old boys in Charleston get rich. We serve our neighbors while they just serve themselves. Our campaign is different. We're the only campaign that doesn't take corporate PAC or lobbyist money. We're the only campaign that's visited every county twice, including yours, 197 town halls later. We're the only campaign that's recruited not just one, but 93 candidates to run up and down the ballot in a pro-labor way. When this crisis came, we were ready. Our coronavirus resource page was up before the governor's. We published our economic relief plan 10 days ago, and still the governor has failed to act. Most important, we are mobilizing a thousand of our campaign volunteers to serve as neighborhood captains. People like you volunteering from home to check in on your neighbors and make sure they have what they need. Because never in American history, never in West Virginia history, has one politician been the solution to our problems. We are the only ones who can save ourselves. We want a government of, by, and for the people. That's why we have a campaign funded by the people. More donations than any campaign in West Virginia history. We need a thousand leaders, not one. That means we need you. All right, thank you. We're going to get right into the questions. I want to explain to you how it's going to work very briefly. We'll ask the question. Each of the other candidates will get a chance to rebut, and the original person who got the question will then get to wrap it up. They'll get two minutes to respond, one minute each for those rebuttals, and then the final wrap-up is 30 seconds. Question one. As you all campaign, this one is going to Mr. Solango, sorry. As you campaign during this coronavirus pandemic, how is this going to help you 
if you are elected governor and another pandemic emerges? Look, the time to plan for a crisis is not two weeks after it starts or three weeks after it starts. The time to pre prepare for a crisis is months and years ahead of time. We were caught flat-footed in West Virginia. There were things that we should have done that we didn't. We should have had a plan in place to make sure that our labs were open 24-7, yet they were running normal hours. In Kanawha County, I had a plan in place. We had a plan just in case Metro 911 went down because one thing I can tell you, when you call 911, you need a person on the other end answering it. So we've support, supported our first responders, transferred $400,000 from our emergency budget into uh, a, a budget for overtime pay for our first responders. We've worked alongside the Emergency Operations Center. Uh, we've we've uh, instituted tracing to make sure that any of those that might be affected by this who might actually have the coronavirus, that we can start notifying their contacts, people that they've been in contact with over the last week to 14 days. West Virginia needs someone who can prepare for a crisis. If, the, if 2016 taught us one thing, Governor Justice did not prepare and did not know, know, know how to implement the RISE program. We're going to get a lot of federal assistance, uh, and we need a governor who can actually implement that and not wait three, four, or five years down the road to help the families that are struggling the most to help the small businesses that are struggling the most, we need somebody who can actually get things done. And that's why I'm running for governor. Okay, Mr. Stallings, you have a minute to respond. Yes, <clears throat> again, uh, the, uh, what we've done with the budget after we cut so many taxes, uh, the corporate net, the business franchise, the food tax, uh, and then when our economy uh, tanked, Instead of doing any type of revenue whatsoever, we cut, cut, cut. We cut DHHR some $200 million, which impacted CPS, the public health departments. In one year alone, we cut the public health departments and the Bureau of Public Health by 25%. Obviously, there's gonna be a lot of federal money being pushed out. So we have to absolutely use that money the best possible way. And I think the first dollar out should go to the small business and entrepreneurs. They're the ones that cannot weather the storm as much as anybody else. We have to be prepared. This is flooding season. So we have to make sure that our uh, National Guard is ready. We ha always have to be on our toes. All right, thank you. We'll move to rebuttal from Mr. Smith. You have one minute. I hope you're angry. I'm angry. There is always money uh, when uh, an out-of-state CEO wants a bailout. And yet here they tell us there's no money, there's no, nothing can be done. Here's a dozen things that could be done off, uh, off the bat. Uh, a promise of no shutoffs and no evictions. Uh, unemployment to all small businesses, self-employed and working class people. Telehealth for all therapists and patients. Paid sick days for all. Vote for mail by all. Uh, a full bed inventory, not just for those who are sick, but for the homeless and for those in the prison system, a child care tax credit, testing every county and expanding what testing is, an economic stimulus package for locally owned businesses only, and a needs directory so that people can pitch in when they want to. We know what to do in a crisis. The people know what to do. We just need a governor who is led by the people and not by his own self-interest. Okay, and Mr. Salango, you have 30 seconds to wrap this up. Working alongside our first responders in the Emergency Operations Center, making sure that we are prepared just in case the first responders uh, become infected with the coronavirus. This has led me to be uniquely qualified uh, to be governor. Uh, epidemics and crises are nothing new in West Virginia. We've had floods, we've had derechos, we've had blizzards. But we haven't seen anything like this, and we need a governor who's going to show up for work, roll up his sleeves, and get things done and get us out of this crisis. All right, time. We're moving on to question two. This topic for the next several will be jobs and economic development. Mr. Stallings, we'll start with you. You have two minutes to respond. If elected, what's the first thing you're going to do to bring jobs to West Virginia? 
Well, again, we've been working on this for some time. I have uh, while in the Senate. We need to uh, support our entrepreneurs. We need to grow our high technology or technology sector. I would open a governor's office of grants and partnerships to take full advantage of the money that's going to be pushed out for the recovery efforts after the coronavirus. If we have absolutely learned one thing about this, we need to move medication manufacturing back to the United States of America. And why not put it in West Virginia since we already have Mylan Pharmaceuticals in Morgantown? We need to make our own personal protective equipment here in West Virginia, if at all possible. West Virginia is one of the richest energy states in the country, and yet we act like we're the poorest. We haven't taken full advantage of our gas. Uh, and uh, we uh, have to have an all-in energy policy. We have to attract those, quote, West Coast companies that like the green energy, the solar panels, et cetera. Uh, we need to support our growing tourism industry. There's so much to be had with our just great natural resources, including our Hatfield-McCoy trails, our flat water paddling. We need to work closely with West Virginia University and Marshall to expand their research capabilities. And again, get those value-added companies uh, down, the, down the line. Uh, we need to invest and uh, capitalize on our rare earth elements which are elements that uh, make electric cars, military engines, batteries. The only place they're located is in a China except for the coal-rich mountains of West Virginia. First of all, we have to have, an, and secondly, we have to have an educated workforce. We have to invest in our education. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Smith, you have one minute to rebut. This is the wealthiest time in West Virginia history. We can have the best roads and schools, the highest wages we've ever had as soon as we stop sending our wealth away. Here's what that looks like. We've got the only plans on this stage to shift hundreds of millions of dollars in tax breaks away from out-of-state companies to small businesses, to start a state bank so we're funding our own infrastructure and jobs programs and keeping that wealth here, family farms and grants, and full legalization of marijuana. We need to invest in schools, not jails, and we're the only campaign that has a plan to get broadband for all by paying for a middle mile, making these companies compete with one another. As soon as we stop rigging our economy in favor of companies that are dodging their taxes and start rigging our economy in favor of small businesses and family farms and entrepreneurs, we can make West Virginia the best place in the country for people who pay their taxes. That's a vision we can achieve as soon as we change who our government answers to. Mr. Solango, you have a minute. We can't keep running the same playbook that we've been running since 1950 and expect a different result. We can't keep running the same ideas over and over again. We have to look at this regionally because the issues they're having in Martinsburg are different than the ones they're having in Morgantown, and they're certainly different than the ones they're having in McDowell County. So we have to look at each area, each region, and come up with solutions. As Kanawha County Commissioner, as a small business owner, I've been on the forefront of economic development for many years. I took an old golf course that was losing $80,000 a year and turned it into a sports complex that generates tens of millions of dollars a year. That was something that people said couldn't be done. I took a program in the Upper Kanawha Valley to turn the unemployed into entrepreneurs called the UCAN program, where we do business grants uh, to get startup businesses in an area, quite frankly, where businesses hadn't developed in many years. We need to do that all over the state. We need to focus on regions and make sure that we develop uh, both high-tech jobs, we have to bring in broadband statewide so we can support our small businesses. And wouldn't it be nice to have broadband coverage right now during this crisis so that our children all over West Virginia could learn from home? All right, and Mr. Stallings, you have 30 seconds to wrap it up. This coronavirus has changed everything. <clears throat> our economy and recovery could result in lots of jobs. We have to focus on these health care jobs critical nursing shortages. We have to pay our nursing instructors more so that people will be 
able to be instructed and taught. So many people don't want to be nursing instructors. We uh, have to, uh, uh, again, in my, in my case, we were able to use our post mine land. We finally have some flat land. And so we can use our Southern West Virginia land for development. All right, we're gonna move to the next question. We'll begin with you, Mr. Smith. If elected, what's your specific plan to keep young people from leaving West Virginia? Yeah, this is what we've been up to for the last 50 years in West Virginia. We keep sending our wealth away and we expect our kids to stay. That's not how it works. As soon as we invest in our own kids, our own places, our own small businesses and our own schools, we can keep our people here. Here's what that looks like. West Virginia is primed to be the first in the nation. Imagine that, the first in the nation. Right now, we have a tax structure in West Virginia and all across the country where the people who have the most pay the least and the people who have the least pay the most. We have an economy that is rigged in favor of those at the very top and those that don't even live here. As soon as we change that, as soon as we become the first in the nation to rig our economy in favor of those of us who are here, those of us who pay taxes, that means shifting the corporate tax rate to help small businesses instead of out-of-state corporations. It means shifting the property tax rate to help local property owners instead of out-of-state land holding companies. It means investing this new revenue into schools and jobs, the nation's most generous loan forgiveness plan and college plan, the nation's most uh, uh, generous plan for small businesses and capital for small businesses. We can do all of those things as soon as we stop letting the people away from here steal from us. I hope to earn your uh, vote for governor not because I came up with all these plans on my own, but because we've built this campaign from the bottom up. We listen to young people all across the country who moved away and those that badly want to stay here. And if we provide them with an economy that is diverse, with ways to start their own businesses, uh, with loan forgiveness programs and decent broadband, people want to stay in West Virginia because we're the best place in the country to live. We just have Time. to act like it. And Mr. Smith, you will, I mean, yeah, Mr. Smith, you get 30 <laughs> seconds. No. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Mr. Salango. You know, when I graduated from Shady Spring High School, I had options. My options were, if I could afford it, I would go to college, which I chose to do, paid for it myself, or I could go into the coal mines. And many times, they would make more than the college graduates. Those options don't really exist for young people now. And so we have to change the way that we're doing business. We have to create strong vocational and technical programs, introducing people to it, students in middle school, and any child who wants to participate in high school should have that opportunity. But more than that, we have to make sure that our best and brightest stay here. For the first time since 1930, we're below 1.8 million people in population. We have to make sure that we pay our educators fairly, that we, we respect our school service personnel, keep those people here so we don't lose them all over, the, all over to other states. When kids come out of high school now, their options, unlike mine, are Charlotte or Columbus. We have to address this problem now to stop the population decline. All right, thank you, Mr. Salango. Mr. Stallings. Thank you. It's truly just about jobs. Again, we've all heard about the reading, writing, and route 21. 21, by the way, back in the old days was to Cleveland or the Rust Belt. Now it's 21, which is I-77 down to Charlotte. It's about jobs. And it's about the type of jobs that people can do here in West Virginia. Again, we have two good institutions that do a lot of research. A lot of those jobs can be research oriented. Uh, the quality of life in West Virginia is second to none. Our outdoors activities uh, with our white water and trail riding, fishing. People want physical activity and they can have it here. I agree that we need to get into the middle school system to find out for a career and technical college or career and technical education, and that's the secret for many jobs that's not even related to uh, education or to higher education. 
All right, thank you, Mr. Stallings and Mr. Smith. Now, you have 30 seconds to wrap that up. Thank you very much. We can make West Virginia the best place in the country to live, work, and raise a family. But to do it, we have to listen to our people. That's what we've done for the last 15 months. We held 11,000 conversations, and as I said, 197 town halls, listening more than talking. Anyone can go and see our plans and how we pay for them at wvcantwait.com. If you like them, share them. If you don't, get in touch with me directly. My cell phone is 304-610-6512. All right, thank you. We're gonna move on to question four now. We'll begin with you, Mr. Salango, again. Two minutes to respond. In this past session, the 2020 session, the GOP pushed that inventory tax elimination bill. It failed. What specific ideas are you bringing to the table to make West Virginia more attractive to those out-of-state businesses and lure them here to begin operations? Let me say this. As Kanawha County Commissioner, as a small business owner, uh, I've worked hard for economic development. In, in Kanawha County. Not one time has a business told me that they're not coming to the state of West Virginia because of, of an inventory tax. In fact, I pay the inventory tax in my small businesses. We have to stop giving away hundreds of millions of dollars. We need to make sure that the people that are passing the laws in, in Charleston understand how that's going to affect counties and municipal government. That bill alone would have devastated Kanawha County. It would have devastated every county in West Virginia. It would have devastated municipalities. A hundred million dollar inventory tax reduction for out-of-state companies. That would have created fewer deputies, fewer teachers, and lots of problems throughout West Virginia. Kanawha County alone would have lost $22 million from that reduction. We have to bring in businesses through what, what resources we have. This is a great state to live, it's a great state to work. But we have to offer, offer them broadband, we have to offer them a drug-free workforce. That's one of the biggest challenges that we have throughout West Virginia. It's workforce participation and it's our opioid dependence issue. I've developed a plan, it's online. It's a long-term plan for substance abuse and it will save West Virginia $8.8 .8 billion per year. $4,800 is what every single West Virginian pays per year because of the substance abuse problem, and that's one of the biggest problems we have with regard to bringing new businesses in. So we have to take that head on, we have to fix it, and we have to have a governor who's paying attention to creating new businesses, including those that aren't his. All right, Mr. Stallings, you have one minute to rebut. Yes, uh, I was on the front lines in the Senate that fought removing the business and inventory tax because it would have left a hundred million dollar hole in the budget. It was going to cost about 300 million uh, to, to remove it and they had about 200 million. So we would have again lost a tremendous amount of county and municipal support and it could not function. We heard from everyone uh, that that could not work. So we fought it and uh, what we need to do again is to have that educated workforce drug free. Uh, and uh, in order to get that, we're gonna have to take care of our substance use disorder. We have to work on our birth to three so that our children are ready to learn when they go into uh, the classroom. We uh, are behind the eight ball on that. We have to reintegrate people with substance use disorder back into the workforce through a full uh, sort of uh, support systems. All right, thank you, Mr. Stallings. And now, Mr. Smith, one minute. This is nothing new, right? You've seen this, it's like a rerun up at the Capitol. Every year uh, they say, uh, let's just help out the Walmarts and Frontiers and Rockwells of the world, and maybe they'll give us a few crumbs at the end. It doesn't work for anyone other than them. Uh, we have every reason to be disgusted because it hurts us. I'm tired of a government that cares more about Walmart and Frontier and Rockwell than it does our own kids. Just a dozen years ago, the legislature, uh, leaders in both parties backed a $212 million tax break to out-of-state corporations. Uh, they agreed on it, right? And it worked that time. And here they are 
uh, trying to do it over and over again for that same $212 million. And we're the only campaign that is causing, that is calling for an end to those tax breaks. We could fund 75 million in tax breaks for small businesses, 75 million in capital for small businesses, and a middle mile broadband. Time. All right, thank you, Mr. Smith and Mr. Solango. 30 seconds to wrap this up. And remember, the question is a specific idea that's going to attract new business. I've been on the forefront of developing new business in Kanawha County for years, both as a business owner and as a Kanawha County Commissioner. We have to make sure that we're out recruiting new business. We've got to make sure that we're paying attention. We have to take care of our opioid problem. And we have to keep our, our young people here. We have to make sure that there is a educated and trained workforce to bring new business in. More importantly, we have to take care of the businesses that we have here now. Small business is the backbone of West Virginia. And we, it's time we put them first and make sure that we're time. working for them. All right, thank you, Mr. Solango. Speaking of time, time for us to take a break. We'll be right back. And just to give you guys a head up, you mentioned the opioid crisis. I'm going to ask you about it when we get back. And welcome back to the WVVA Democratic Gubernatorial Debate. We're going to jump right back in with the questions. And as promised, this one is about the opioid epidemic. This question goes first to Mr. Stallings. How will your administration tackle the opioid epidemic? Uh, over the past 14 years, I have been at the point of the arrow as far as trying to tackle the opioid or substance use disorder. Uh, you know, these uh, drug companies uh, misled us and said that, uh, you know, this, uh, these drugs are not very addictive. We didn't realize the risks back in the day. And we were given a pain scale of zero to 10 that we were supposed to manage. In my practice, uh, I have a geriatric practice for the most part. And so we couldn't use the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and Tylenol didn't work. So uh, we used those uh, retrospectively, uh, not realizing the full risk. And there was a lot of pain in, in our patients, uh, a lot of arthritis, a lot of obesity. And so over the past several years, I've worked on many bills that basically tried to address it. One of them is limiting the initial prescriptions. We now know that the risks and the benefit ratio is, is different. And so we don't want people to get started on these medicines. For the people that were in the pipeline, people that had been on these medicines for 20 years or so, we found out something. As we went after the pill mills and the heavy prescribers, the number of opioid prescriptions went way down, but the number of overdose deaths went way up because we didn't have any recovery programs for these patients. So we know now, so we tried to turn off the spigot. We're managing the people that are in the pipeline. And now we absolutely had to get Narcan out there so that people would not overdose. And now we're talking very heavily about recovery uh, and uh, getting people the full realm of recovery services and reintegration back into the workforce. Part of that involves getting their oral health, and we passed a bill this past year that would allow oral health for poor adults. All right, thank you. Mr. Smith, you have one minute for a rebuttal. 
No one knows your problems better than you do and how to solve them. That's what we believe. So we built our opioid and drug response plan from the bottom up, listening to people in recovery and people on the front lines. This isn't just an opioid crisis, it's a pain crisis. Here's some of the things they told us. One, community-based treatment in every county. Two, a recovery jobs program. Three, shifting money from prisons to treatment so we aren't caging people for being sick and poor. Four, trauma-informed schools and money for counselors. Five, make the drug companies pay and push those dollars down into the communities and frontline workers and people in recovery. Six, dignity and respect and decent pay for first responders. Seven, harm reduction in every county. Eight, respect for chronic pain survivors. At the end of the day, you have to ask whose side are we going to be on? We are on, the, are on the side of patients and people in recovery. That's why we don't take money from pharmaceutical companies. Uh, Mr. Solango, you have one minute. West Virginia leads the nation in opioid dependence, and we lead the nation in opioid deaths. We need to be bold and lead the nation in opioid recovery. I've developed a plan with some of the leading experts in the field called West Virginia Recovery First that focuses on long-term recovery options for patients and also vocational training. Right now, when, when a patient has an opioid dependence problem, they have 28 to 30 days of treatment, and then they're right back into the environment where, where they started. This plan is different. It's a long-term recovery plan that also permits them to get a GED or vocational or technical training because we have to give them hope. Every person that I know has been affected by the opioid epidemic. We have to lead the nation now in making sure that our family members and our friends recover and get back into society. Okay, and Mr. Smith, you have 30 seconds to wrap it up. Ron Stallings. Mr. Stallings, <laughs> I'm uh, so sorry. Again, I agree with what's been said. Uh, there's been a real stigma issue. We have to deal with that stigma. Uh, one of the parts of the bill that I passed would, would allow integration of recovery and treatment into the primary care setting so you didn't have to go to a suboxone clinic or something like that. So uh, we have to support our grand families and kinship care and we did a foster care reform bill this past year that helps do that. All right, we're going to move right on to question six. This is about the party. We're going to begin with Mr. Smith, two minutes to respond. How will you revive support for Democrats in West Virginia when so many have lost all faith in the party? Thank you for this question. This is a real problem. People have lost faith in both parties and too often rightly so. Uh, that over and over again in West Virginia history, we've seen people make promises and then turn their backs on us. What we need in the Democratic Party is not one guy, but thousands of leaders across the state. If we do that, we can have a party that is the most pro-labor party we've ever had and the strongest party we've ever had. We need the opposite of Jim Justice at the top of this ticket. Justice was a rich guy who self-funded and uh, took money from lobbyists, many of his own lobbyists invested in his, in his campaign we're proud to have the only campaign that isn't self-funding and refuses money from corporate lobbyists. Jim Justice won't even leave the Greenbrier. Our campaign has visited every county at least twice. Jim Justice says, just trust me, and doesn't offer any specifics. We've got our 31 clear plans written by the people and how to pay for them online and open for you to see. And Jim Justice, like too many good old boy politicians before him, he was never really a Democrat or a Republican. He just had a dollar sign after his name. And it was always about him. In our campaign, we've done something a little different from the beginning. We said at the beginning of this campaign, we're going to need more than one person up there in the Capitol. And so we said, we're going to try to find other people to run for office, working class people, young people, folks who are left out of the political process. And we said, if we can find 10 or 15, that would be amazing. But we only wanted folks who don't take corporate cash and promise never to cross a picket line. Here we are a year later, 93 of us 
have signed a pledge to run for office. Most of us are 40 years of age or younger. 14 of us are educators. We can win that government when we come together and Time. take it. Mr. Salango. I registered as a Democrat when I was 18 years old and haven't changed. We've got to remind people that the West Virginia Democratic Party is available for everyone, not just the far left, but everyone. We've got to remind people that the West Virginia Democratic Party is about working families. Keep in mind that the West Virginia Democratic Party has always supported labor unions. And right now, more than ever, we see how valuable they are. It's the Teamsters that's keeping our supply chain up and running. It is, it's, a, uh, it's the healthcare workers on the front lines battling this epidemic. The firefighters, the police officers, the sheriff's association, those are the ones that are really battling now. And what thanks do they get? The legislature passes right to work to make sure that they have less food on their table for their families. We have to make sure that we stand up against right to work. We have to promote prevailing wage and return to the party where we were years ago. And Mr. Stallings. Yeah. I think the uh, West Virginia Democratic Party is a little different than the Washington, D.C. Democratic Party. Uh, we uh, do put West Virginians first and West Virginia families first. When I think of the Democratic Senate caucus and the big hearts that we have trying to help people uh, get a good quality public education, how hard we fought against the privatization of uh, schools, uh, it, it just it brings a warm warmness to my heart. The social issues are always divisive uh, and uh, always polarizing. And uh, I think one of the problems that our Democratic Party has is we need to decentralize the power. That's something that uh, I think has really crushed the Democratic Party over the past decade or so. All right, thank you. And Mr. Smith, 30 seconds. Yeah, I'm reminded of our history that politicians didn't win the mine wars, politicians didn't lead the educator strike. Uh, politicians, Democrats or Republicans, they're not gonna be the ones that save us. It's not your job to support Democrats, it's my job to earn your vote. It's our party's <clears throat> job to fight as hard for our people as our people fight for ourselves, fight for themselves, excuse me. Uh, again, my number is 304-610-6512. I hope you'll let me earn your vote. The next question, opposite side of that, the GOP controls West Virginia's legislature. Starting with you, Mr. Salango, in two minutes to respond, how will you affect change without compromising your goals in a GOP-led legislature? We need a new governor, and it needs to be one of the people on this stage. To do that, we've got to work with a Republican legislature. And that's why I've put forward common sense plans that promote working families and that will appease people both in the Democratic Party and also the Republican Party. I have plans like the rural hospital plan that will save rural hospitals like Fairmont Regional Medical Center and OVMC from closing, focusing on changing the payment structure from per patient Medicaid reimbursement to global reimbursement to keep those hospitals open. Democrats and Republicans want to do that. Democrats and Republicans want to keep rural hospitals open. I have an opioid plan. It's called West Virginia Recovery First. Democrats and Republicans want to treat those who are suffering from opioid epidemic uh, addiction. We have plans. We all want the same thing. We want to move West Virginia forward and put West Virginia first. How we get there, we may disagree, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter to me whether it's a Democratic idea or a Republican idea. All I care is that it's a good idea. All right, Mr. Stallings. Thank you. Well, for the past 14 years, I've been in the majority and I've been in the minority, and I've been effective in both roles. You build relationships as a senator, and you have to in order to get things done. The governor's office is a place where people come together, bipartisan and bicameral. So you have the House, the Senate, Republicans and Democrats. That's what I will do. I will bring people together to form these ideas. 
whether you have a Republican House, a Democratic Senate, which is what I would love to have, then we would have to come to the middle to get things done. We would have to work with them. They would have to work with us. If it's both houses that are Republican, then I have experience in getting things done. And again, you have to use that governor's office as a real tool and build those relationships. Okay, and Mr. Smith, one minute. I think this is the most important question. It's my favorite question. Uh, first, there is a lot that a governor can do without the legislature. My favorite one of our policy plans cooked up in town halls across this state is to form a corporate crime and political corruption division in our state police. That right now we have uh, corporate criminals and corrupt politicians running rampant in West Virginia because we don't have anybody out there policing them. That's an idea we can implement on day one without a legislature. Second, I disagree with uh, my uh, colleagues up here that we have to work with a Republican legislature. We're doing everything we possibly can to not have a Republican legislature uh, in the fall. That's why we've recruited and supported 93 down ballot candidates, uh, because we got to do everything we can to win one of those chambers. And finally, we disagree about what the real fight is. We don't think the real fight in West Virginia is Republican, Democrat, left versus right. We think it's the good old boys versus everybody else. And we have to be willing to fight that fight, not negotiate time, time. against our own interests. Question eight. We will start with Mr. Stallings. And it's about the foster care crisis. How do you plan to deal with the issues facing West Virginia's foster care system? As I mentioned earlier, uh, during the uh, very lean years of the budget after we cut a lot of taxes that benefited mostly rich people, uh, the idea was to cut DHHR, and we did, and we cut it significantly. Again, $200 million. That impacted the Child Protective Services, the Birth to Three program, and the foster care system. Uh, the families now get only $600 a month to help raise a kid. Uh, we have uh, tried our best to uh, do significant foster care reform. It's under a, a managed care organization now so that there could be better uh, streamlining, continuation of care. If someone goes from one family to another, their health records would go with them. This past year, we were able to increase funding to foster care around $17 million. It was going to be a lot less, but we fought for more. Uh, we improved grand families and kinship care, which is critical uh, because that's really been an exploding part of the foster care system. Uh, we also had a transition. So what happens when you're older in a foster care uh, uh, person is you, you need to transition into adulthood. And that's, we were losing about 50% of the foster care kids would end up in the, being incarcerated. So we have now a transition out of foster care with education and social supports so that we can, uh, again, get these folks with a job, training, et cetera. That's something that we were passionate about this past year. It's something we have to have ongoing uh, you know, focus. Uh, these kids are precious. You know, with cutting uh, the budget so much, there were, uh, you know, again, uh, 7,000 in foster care, 10,000 children were considered homeless and 200 foster, or foster care kids were actually missing. So we have to do a better job, and part of it is just all hands on deck and focus. All right, thank you. Mr. Smith, one minute. This one is personal for me and uh, my family. Um, my wife and I have been foster parents uh, in the past. Um, it is outrageous what we ask people to do. It's outrageous the burdens we put on these children. Um, and our government is making it worse. Uh, just a couple months after we got our last kid, um, the state government privatized the health care of foster kids. They said, you know what? Uh, these private insurance companies aren't making enough money off of these uh, foster kids. Uh, we got to give them more money so they can make even more money on top of that. Uh, reducing services. This has been a disaster in other states, but this is what happens when you have a government that is run by corporate lobbyists and not by us. Uh, other things we can do and need to do is equality so that uh, kinship families get the same benefits as foster families and 
for the love of everything that is good in this world, we need to pay our CPS workers better and give them the resources they need. All right, and Mr. Salango, one minute. I've seen firsthand the problems in the foster system and with DHHR, both as a commissioner and as an attorney. I've seen it, my wife is a prosecutor, she's now a circuit judge. We deal with it all the time. So my plan is simple and it's common sense. We're gonna break up DHHR. We're gonna pull all the, the, all the dealings with children out and make it separate. We're gonna create the Bureau of Child Advocacy so that we can focus on children and we can focus on foster families. We're gonna put social workers in every single school so there's direct communication from the school to the court system and to the families. We've gotta do this to make sure that we put our kids first. And we need to do something that I've already done in Kanawha County, which is 12 weeks paid family leave for everyone. We've gotta make sure that all state workers don't have to choose between serving as a foster parent and getting a paycheck. We need to do it for grandparents, foster parents, adoptive parents, and natural parents. All right, and Mr. Stallings? We have to wrap our arms around these foster kids. First, but we also have to try to prevent them. We have to support families. We have to do the birth to three program so that these children are cared for. We have to get their parents a job. We have to get their parents uh, substance use treatment and recovery. We have to turn the spigot off first and then we won't have as many that's flooding the system now. And we absolutely just have to focus on the, on the child. All right, thank you very much. Now, we're going to be wrapping this up real soon and we're gonna end like we started, except with the closing statement. And we'll do it in the reverse order. Each candidate will get two minutes for their closing statement. And we'll begin with Mr. Stephen Smith. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, this campaign, the last 15 months, have been the most thrilling of my life because I've gotten to travel this state and learn from the people. I promise you that I'm not perfect. I promise you uh, that at some point in this race, I will disappoint you. I promise you that I don't have the answer to every problem or uh, issue that you're dealing with, but I know that you do. I wanna urge everyone who's watching, please take a look at our plans, uh, please help us make them better. And if you want a government that doesn't just answer to one person or one party or one out-of-state corporation or lobbyist, if you want a government that answers to us, to our children and families, that says that the people who are the most vulnerable ought to be the people writing the laws and deciding the budget because they know best, I want to invite you to come help us build that government. Uh, maybe today is the day you become a neighborhood captain, signing up on our website, wvcantwait.com, to check in on your neighbors. Maybe you take a look at one of our plans and put it up against your own experience and tell us what we're getting wrong. You can contact me directly at stephen at wvcantwait.com or 304-610-6512. Maybe today is the day that you decide you're gonna help a friend who's running for office pitch in and be their campaign manager. Maybe the day, today is the day you keep doing what you are already doing because the people of this state are always taking on more and more and doing with less and less. That is the secret to our campaign. That's the secret to the government of West Virginia is that the answers we need have always been inside of us, uh, in communities, in neighborhoods, in unions. They are there waiting for us as soon as we stand up and take them. We are the only ones who can save ourselves. Mr. Stallings. Thank you and thanks WVVA for hosting this debate again. As I watch what's happening in our state with our prescription drugs, uh, skyrocketing, our hospitals are closing, the opioid or substance use disorder is tearing apart our families and communities, and now the coronavirus is impacting everyone, but particularly our most vulnerable and elderly patients. I can't help but think of all the people standing up here tonight that I'm the person that's most uniquely qualified uh, to lead our state. As a physician, I know the health care challenges that face us, as your governor, I'll put together a bipartisan plan 
to help grow our economy by supporting our small businesses and entrepreneurs, expand broadband, and replicate current successful programs like the Intuit Prosperity Hub here in Bluefield. I have the relationships with leaders of both parties and have a 14-year record of accomplishments. This year alone, I worked with my colleagues to pass the Prescription Drug Pricing Transparency Act to lower prescription drug costs, additional funding for foster care and grand families and kinship care. I was able to amend the budget to include $2 million for the coronavirus response, legislation to expand broadband services, expanded dental services for adult Medicaid members, legislation that will allow our seniors to age in place. These are all initiatives that will make a significant impact on the lives of West Virginians. I have the record, not just to plan on paper. I have 14 years of experience as a state legislator and the relationships that can get things done. I'm uniquely qualified to be the next governor of West Virginia, and I hope you'll follow me at stallingsforwestvirginia.com, Stallings for West Virginia Facebook, and I humbly ask for your vote. Okay, and Mr. Salanga. West Virginia needs new leadership, particularly during a time of crisis. And despite what you've heard, we're not on an economic rocket ship ride. Our infrastructure is crumbling. We're losing population at a rapid pace, including 57,000 people who've decided to leave over the last five years. We have an opioid epidemic that's plaguing the state, and now we're dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. We need somebody who gets things done, somebody who will stand up, take charge, and move West Virginia forward. I've done that as Kanawha County Commissioner, and I've done it as a business leader. As Kanawha County Commissioner, I've developed uh, unique things, outside the box thinking, to make sure that we transition our economy, to make sure that we bring in new business, good paying tech jobs, and opportunities for people to stay here. We need someone who's gonna stand up with working families, stand with our labor unions, and move West Virginia forward. Again, I wasn't born rich, I worked for every single thing that I have because that's what true West Virginians do. And when you start from nothing, unlike our governor, you, know, you appreciate the value of a hard day's work. I'm going to do that for all West Virginians. I'm going to roll up my sleeves and I'm going to get things done. We're going to make sure that we move West Virginia forward. I'm Ben Salango and I'd be honored to have your vote. But for now, everyone stay safe. All right. Um so I'm going to go off script here a little bit. And we've heard about policy and what your political platforms are. But I want to ask you about you as people. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds to answer the question. You're all going to get the same question. We're going to start in the middle with Mr. Stallings, then Mr. Smith, and we'll get you to wrap up, Mr. Salango. And this is an easy question. So when you're away from your job and away from politics and campaigning, what do you do to let your hair down and relax? Thank you, Martin. Again, I'm kind of an outdoors person. I love hiking. I went home for lunch today and hiked to the top of my hill. I like sitting around a fire with friends in the evening, trying to solve the world's problems, if you would. I love four-wheeling. We have a great place in southern West Virginia to four-wheel. Uh, I also love flat water paddling. Uh, we have a great resource and uh, I, sh I like showing off West Virginia, if you would. I try to be an ambassador. I'm a sports fan. I love the Mountaineers. I love the herd and uh, go to all those games and just absolutely uh, enjoy being a true West Virginian. All right. Thank you. Mr. Smith, what do you do to relax? Yeah, so I'm lucky to be married to the most brilliant and ferocious and incredible woman on the planet. Her name is Sarah Whitaker. She's a public defender in Kanawha County. Uh, I don't know if it's relaxing necessarily, but there's nothing that makes me feel more at home than getting the chance to talk to her, to process my day. That uh, every day I get a little more courage to do this because of the courage she takes into a courtroom every day standing next to people that no one else wants to stand next to. That's the thing that makes me feel most at home. All right, thank you. And Mr. Solango, 30 seconds. I am incredibly blessed. I've been married for 19 years to my wife, Tara. 
uh, who's a circuit judge. I have two uh, wonderful kids, TJ, who's 17, and Caden, who's 12. Uh, and we love sports. We love, uh, I'm a soccer coach, love coaching, uh, love helping out in the community. And I have a wonderful family, my mom, Debbie, who's watching at home, and uh, my brother and sister, PJ and Christy, and uh, Tim, who lives in Morgantown, works for uh, Milan. So I'm very blessed. I love to unplug the PlayStations, take the kids <laughs> out to Kanawha State Forest for a good hike. All right, thank you so much. We hope we helped all of you out there make a decision don't forget to get out and vote in the primary in May. Thank you. Hello, I'm Executive Director Chuck Roberts, speaking on behalf of your West Virginia Public Broadcasting family. We send you and yours wishes of good health as our state and national officials work to contain the spread of